Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Kerry Parker. Today we have episode 325 for May 22nd, 2023. Got a news show for you today. Got several interesting articles to go over. Uh, before we do, though, uh, another update on Apple. If you've got Apple stuff, be sure you're updating your products. There has been yet another security software update for actively exploited bugs. And this is pretty much all your Apple devices. So iPhones, iPads, Macintoshes, get those updated. Some of them were fixed by that security update, that rapid security response thing that we talked about recently. Some of them were covered in that. I think there's at least one new bug that was not covered by that. So yeah, it's just, just make sure you stay updated. I mean, I know I say this all the time, and it seems like every week I'm doing this. And really what you just need to do is just need to get in the habit of automatically updating your software. That way you don't have to worry about it. You'll probably still need to get a pop-up saying, yes, I want to update or update me tonight or but set your settings for automatic updates because you want to get these things pretty much as soon as they come out. Quick update on the joint Apple Google anti-tracker spec th that I talked about last week or the week before, I guess the week before. The devil is always in these things is in the details. Uh, I have since heard more about this spec and some of the things it contains. There are some... There are some controversial things. For example, these devices, uh, these tracking devices like Apple AirTags in particular, but uh, if the spec is adopted, this will be used by multiple different vendors. The idea is to have all these devices registered in a central database so that if a device is found to be tracking someone else, there will be some limited and restricted mechanisms by which you can figure out the owner of that device. In particular, law enforcement will be able to do that. I know that might give some people some pause, but from what I've heard, by the way, Apple's already doing this. Uh, now, you do have to go through Apple first. You have to show a warrant or some sort of legal document. You can't just come in and ask for it, even if you're in law enforcement. Uh, so they are enforcing some restrictions on who can access this, and it's not just willy-nilly. Nevertheless, this already exists today, and I think, you know, as long as it's based on a a warrant or something. I think that makes sense. I think that's the right compromise. So they do not open this to location tracking. For example, law enforcement supposedly cannot go to Apple and find out where all your Apple devices are. Now, of course, for cell phones and things like that, it's very different. There's a lot of different ways to track a cell phone's location. But from this specs perspective anyway, supposedly the only thing that will be available is some limited information. So it's basically contact information about the owner of the device. All right, so moving on to our topics for this week. First up, some positive news. The FBI and the NSA have cut off a notorious Russian malware campaign. Intel has deployed some undisclosed microcode security updates for quite a few of their uh, processors. There are some new top-level domains, and those are like .com, .net, .org. Those are all TLDs, top-level domains. There are some new TLDs that have been released that might be causing some problems and hackers might be trying to exploit to trick you. Some researchers have found a security flaw in the Wemo smart plug, particularly the version 2 of the smart plug, and Belkin, the owner of Wemo, says they will not be fixing them because those devices have been end of life. Some Chinese state-sponsored hackers have been installing some very clever and tricky malware on home routers. And the EFF has put out a very good article that explains some of the problems around these uh, new laws popping up, trying to block access to porn and, in some cases, social media by uh, minors. And that age verification is going to cause all sorts of knock-on problems. So I want to read this article that talks about that. And then Apple is going to be releasing this really cool new feature that's under the accessibility umbrella and accessibility generally is for people who have some sort of disability or limitation that uh, the Apple software has some interesting ways to help them work around. And this one is going to be called personal voice. And it's for people who may be losing or are losing the ability to speak and allows them to basically capture or, or bank as they call it their voice sounds so that they can actually generate text to speech using their own voice after they've lost the ability to speak. But I'm going to tell you why everybody might want to take advantage of that. And then finally, my tip of the week actually is also tied with a Dear Carrie question. 
about the use of pass keys. And I mentioned this recently as well, that I wanted to talk about how pass keys work and give you an update, because there are some troubling things going on with the implementation of a very cool and secure standard that we are calling pass keys. So I will talk to you about that in the tip of the week slash dear carry question answer. So there's your preview. Let's get to it. All right, this is from tech.co, and it's about a, a win, a security win. The NSA, FBI, and their allies say they have cut the head off a Russian-sponsored malware campaign known as Snake. I see what they did there. That was the most sophisticated cyber espionage tool possessed by the country. According to the statement titled, Hunting Russian Intelligence State Malware, the operation can be traced back to Russia's notorious FSB, or Federal Security Services, which is a Russian acronym, which is why the letters don't match up, and may have been active in one form or another for as many as 20 years. The advisory was released alongside technical details of the malware, which should allow cybersecurity experts to detect and eliminate the program on their networks. And that's a link. So if you're an IT person or know an IT person and you want to find out more about that, go to my show notes, find this article, and then click that link. The breadth of the snake hack is astonishing, with the malware detected on computers in more than 50 countries around the world, many of whom share NATO membership with the U.S. In one example, the malware was implanted on a victim in NATO, after which bad actors were able to access and steal various diplomatic communications, including sensitive documents. For now, the threat appears to be neutralized. Government agencies say they were able to disable snake on infected devices using the FBI's Perseus tool, which allows for the overriding of malware. The joint statement issued by the International Cybersecurity Advisory Body, or CSA for short, adds that government networks, research facilities, education organizations, and journalists in particular were targeted by Snake and the FSB hackers who ran it. In addition, critical infrastructure sectors like financial services, manufacturing, and communications were zeroed in on. So the article goes on, but I think you got the gist of it there. That's good news. It's always nice to hear that there's, there are some good things happening out there with respect to this, especially when it comes to these massive state-sponsored actors. That that's that's really big news. All right, next up, this is from Tom's Hardware, and this is about an Intel uh, CPU microcode update, <laughs> uh, as spotted by Linux publication Pharonix. Intel released CPU microcode update for processors all the way back to Coffee Lake on Friday afternoon, and I think this was a more than a week ago now. Unfortunately, the changelog doesn't delve into details other than that the new microcode fixes an undisclosed security issue. The security issue didn't make the list on Patch Tuesday, a colloquial term referring to companies that released patches on the second Tuesday of each month. Furthermore, Pharonix noted that there hadn't been any mentions of CPU microcode update or any new Intel security advisory for the month. Security advisories are fixes for vulnerabilities that Intel has discovered affecting its products. Given the sudden CPU microcode release, it's safe to assume that the security vulnerability is likely a new one that Intel hasn't publicly communicated yet. However, it's not unheard of for chipmakers to roll out security updates or microcode before the issue comes to light. Whatever the security vulnerability may be, it evidently affects many of Intel's platforms, including the latest consumer Intel 13th generation Core Raptor Lake and 4th generation Xenon Sapphire Rapids server chips. However, it's the first time that recent lineups such as Alder Lake N and Atomic and Atom C series received a microcode update. The lengthy list includes desktop processors dating as far back as Coffee Lake days and mobile chips starting with KB Lake going forward. Without proper documentation, we cannot assess the scope of the security issue. Intel's list only mentions the platforms that will receive the new microcode. It doesn't expressly state whether the issue only impacts the platforms mentioned in the list or if legacy processors before Coffee Lake are also susceptible. Motherboard vendors typically include new microcode in their firmware updates. However, unless it's a pressing issue, sometimes it takes a bit when manufacturers release new firmware. Occasionally, it's faster for chip makers to push the microcode update through a Windows update. However, this medium has disadvantages since it doesn't alter the hardware or the firmware. Instead, the operating system must load the microcode during each restart. Okay, so I know there's a lot of technical gobbledygook in there. But basically what this is saying is that your motherboard runs its own software. Basically, it's kind of an own operating system, usually referred to as BIOS. And that's the first thing that starts whenever you fire up a PC. And then it eventually loads the Windows operating system or Linux operating system. So what this is saying is that there's some sort of bug uh, down in the motherboard code. 
and that the temporary fix uh, from the operating system is to basically kind of patch that microcode after the operating system loads. But the real fix is you want to get your BIOS updated. So keep a lookout for BIOS updates from your motherboard vendors. And I know that a lot of you are going, huh? Because <laughs> that's something you don't normally even think about. When you first fire up a PC, oftentimes, or a Linux box, oftentimes you will see uh, the splash screen for the motherboard and the BIOS first, and then you'll see the window screen. Or sometimes you have to hold down a certain key sequence uh, in order to get access to that while your computer is booting up. So I know that's probably gone over a lot of your heads, but if you know enough to know what I mean, then you need to be, then you should check your motherboard to see if it has a BIOS update. And if so, apply that soon. And if not, make sure you get your Windows and Linux updates, which should at least have this other form of patching, which will help in the meantime. And that, if that is beyond your technical capabilities, then just know that you've got some operating system updates that should hopefully address the same issue in a less ideal way, but keep your operating system up to date to make sure you're getting those security updates. All right, next up, this is from Bleeping Computer, and it's about a massive data leak from Toyota. Toyota Motor Corporation, and that is really hard to say quickly, disclosed a data breach on its cloud environment that exposed the car location information of over 2 million customers for 10 years between November of 2013 and April of 2023. According to a security notice published in the company's Japanese newsroom, the data breach resulted from a database misconfiguration that allowed anyone to access its content without a password. This incident exposed the information of customers who used the company's T-Connect G-Link, G-Link Lite, or G-Book services between January of 2012 and April 17th of 2023. T-Connect is Toyota's in-car smart service for voice assistance, customer service support, car status and management, and on-road emergency help. The information exposed in the misconfiguration database includes the in-vehicle GPS navigational terminal ID number, the chassis number, or VIN, and vehicle location information with time data. While there's no evidence that the data was misused, unauthorized users could have accessed the historical data and possibly the real-time location of over 2 million Toyota cars. It is important to note that the exposed details do not constitute personally identifiable information, so it wouldn't be possible to use this data leak to track individuals unless the attacker knew the VIN of their target's car. A car's VIN, also known as a chassis number, is easily accessible, so someone with enough motivation and physical access to a target's car could theoretically have exploited the decade-long data leak for location tracking. A second Toyota statement published in the Japanese Toyota Connected site also mentions the possibility of video recordings taken outside the vehicle have been exposed in this incident. The exposure period for these recordings was defined between November of 2016 and April of 2023, which is nearly seven years. Again, the exposure of these videos would not severely impact the car owner's privacy, hmm, but this depends on the conditions, time, and location. Toyota has promised to send individual apology notices to impacted customers and set up a dedicated call center to handle their queries and requests. All right, so there's just been way too many of these things happening. Databases not locked down at all and available on the web for anybody to find. And while this article, you know, makes a point of saying, we don't know if this stuff has been abused. The bad guys have tools that are constantly scouring the web, looking for exactly these sorts of things, trying to find, you know, unsecured servers or unsecured databases or other services running on these servers. And they're scanning automatically all the time. So while they said that they don't know if this has been uh, found or abused, I would say it's certainly possible. And I will say, by the way, <laughs> it says, you know, you well, you'd have to have physical access to the car to get the VIN. Well, there's other ways to find the VIN of a vehicle that is, you know, registered other places too, like with your insurance company, with the Department of Transportation or whoever you, wherever you've got your car registered. And yes, if you have physical access to the car, you can usually get it by just looking in the front of the windshield. You could check this on your car right now. Go to your car, look at, I think it's right in front of the driver's side, uh, just down in front of the, under the windshield, you should be able to read the car's VIN number. It's also stamped on several parts inside the car, but that would require you pop in the hood or something. But anyway, I, I don't think it's that hard to get somebody's VIN number. And if you're going to track somebody, you probably want to track a specific person. So, you know, therefore you would either probably know that person or be trying to get information about that person. So 
anyway, it, this is bad, uh, but the, they, they, they finally did block access. I just can't believe it took them this long to figure it out. I mean, this has been out there on the cloud for 10 years. Man, and and what's what's the legal liability for this company? Probably nothing. Probably nothing will happen unless somebody can prove somehow that they were directly harmed by this. That that the fact that the data was available is not in and of itself a crime in the U.S. currently, and there's no standing basically to sue for damages. <sighs> so frustrating. All right, moving on. This is from Digital Trends, and I, I don't like the title of this. It, the title of this article is Hackers Are Using a Devious New Trick to Infect Your Devices. That's kind of clickbaity, uh, and it kind of misses the point. But anyway, let me read this article, then I'll give you my take. Hackers have long used lookalike domain names to trick people into visiting malicious websites, but now the threat posed by this tactic could be about to ramp up significantly. That's because two new domain name extensions have been approved, which could lead to an epidemic of phishing attempts. The two new top-level domains, or TLDs, that are causing such consternation are .zip and .mov extensions. They've just been introduced by Google alongside with .dad, .esq, .prof, .phd, .nexus, and .foo names. But the reason why .zip and .mov have generated such controversy is that they impersonate popular file extensions used on Windows and macOS computers. That makes them ripe for malevolent trickery. Many messaging apps and social media websites automatically convert a word ending in a TLD to a website link, meaning that simply telling a friend about a file you want to send them could transform your words into a clickable URL. If a hacker has already registered that URL and is using it for nefarious purposes, your friend could be sent to a harmful website. Bleeping Computer demonstrated the problem with an example message that read, First extract the test.zip file and then look for test.mov. Once you have the test.mov file, double-click on it to watch the video. If a hacker has registered test.zip and test.mov domains, the message recipient could visit the link in the message and find themselves at risk of downloading an infected file. After all, they might naturally expect that the URL they visit will contain the file they've been told to download. The risk isn't just theoretical. In fact, cybersecurity firm Silent Push Labs has already seen this kind of sleight of hand out in the wild, with phishing websites being created at Microsoft-Office.zip and Microsoft-Office365.zip, which likely attempt to steal user login credentials by impersonating the official Microsoft website. Needless to say, you shouldn't visit these sites due to the threat they pose. While there are plenty of legitimate uses for .zip and .mov domains, such as for file compression apps or video streaming platforms, there also appears to be potential for abuse, something that hackers are apparently already taking advantage of. If you see a link that ends in .zip, .zip, or .move.mov, and it appears to be linked to a large company like Microsoft or Apple or Google or whatever, something famous, first research that the domain actually belongs to that company before clicking on the link. In fact, you shouldn't visit any website or download any file sent by someone you do not trust, regardless of whether the .zip or .mov TLDs are involved. Using an antivirus app and a healthy dose of skepticism should go a long way toward mitigating the myriad threats online, including from hackers making use of these new domains. And you know how I feel about antivirus software, so uh, I wouldn't necessarily go with that. But yes, just be careful and know that <laughs> starting recently, there are actual websites now that like ending in .com, .net, .org, and some of these other things can now end with .zip and .mov. I personally think this is a massive mistake. I don't know how this was allowed. Uh, it's just too confusing. And it's, it is absolutely going to be used to fool some people and cause problems. I, there's just, it's not worth it. We should not have made .zip and .mov these very, very common, very, very popular file name extensions also into valid top-level domains. There's just no reason to introduce that kind of ambiguity on something that could be abused. So anyway, it is what it is. So just be very careful if you see links that end in .zip and .mov. Next, we go to 9to5Mac, uh, and they've got a story about Wemo smart plugs that will not be fixed ever. IoT security company Sternum has discovered a vulnerability in one of Belkin's smart home devices. Sternum found the flaw specifically with the Belkin Wemo Mini Smart Plug V2, which works with HomeKit, Google Assistant, and Amazon Alexa. 
After reaching out to Belkin about the security issue, Sternum was told that, quote, the device is at the end of its life and will not be patched, unquote. The tough part is there are likely hundreds of thousands of V2 versions in the wild. And note that version 4 is the latest model from Belkin, and it does not suffer from this flaw. After talking with Belkin, Sternum shared the full background details on the flaw today. Here are the highlights. Wemo Mini Smart Plug version 2 is managed by a mobile application that allows its user to change the device name. You know, kitchen smart plug or whatever. The name length is limited to 30 characters or less, but the rule is only enforced by the app itself, not enforced by the firmware in the device. Through a process of reverse engineering, we saw that circumventing the character limit resulted in a buffer overflow. And I'll circle back to that in a minute. Through experimentation, we learned that we could obtain a measure of control and predictability over how the overflow occurred. Leveraging these findings, we were able to demonstrate how the vulnerability can be used for command injection. Since Belkin won't be issuing a patch for the device, Sternum recommends the following. Avoid exposing the Wemo Smart Plug V2 UPnP ports to the internet, either directly or via port forwarding. I'll come back to that in a minute. If you are using the Smart Plug V2 in a sensitive network, you should ensure that it is properly segmented and that device cannot communicate with other sensitive devices on the same subnet. But of course, if those steps don't fully resolve concerns or if you're not quite sure how to execute them, the safest option is to stop using the Wemo Mini Smart Plug V2. So circling back, this is a classic case of input validation failure. And in the world of software engineering, you've always got to validate your inputs, especially if they're coming from a user or from the net or something else, which inputs usually are. And what happened here basically is that there's a limit on how many characters you could use to name this particular device in your app. So you could say, you know, turn on the kitchen lights or turn on the bedroom lights or whatever, because you can, you know, give it a name so you know what, which one this thing is. Uh, and so the app was the one in charge of enforcing the limit on that thing, but it turns out there are other ways to change the name of that device over the network. Uh, there are APIs or something available on that device that lets you change the, the name to something else. And because the enforcement of the length of that name was in the app itself, not on the device, you could put in a name that was much longer than the 30 character limit. And as soon as you could do that, you can overflow the buffer, which is kind of like putting, you know, five pounds of dirt in a one pound bag. It's going to overflow. So when you do that, you can trample the memory and then you can start adding data and, and commands and things in that extra space and trick the device's computer into running your code instead of whatever code was on there. That's what happened here. Now, UPnP is universal plug and play. This should be basically disabled always at this point. This is a technology that allows devices on your home network to talk to your router, the gateway for your home network that connects everything on your home network to the internet, your bouncer, the thing that's, that's protecting all your devices. And it could say, hey, I want to talk to something out on the internet and I want them to be able to initiate the conversation. So poke a hole in the firewall at this exact point, because I know that's where they're going to come knocking. And hey, when they come, just let them on through. You almost never, ever want to allow that to happen. And for the vast majority of this audience, I will just say never. So if you have UPnP enabled on your router, and you, you'll have to go look at the settings, if you have universal plug and play enabled, I would absolutely turn that off. Now, the segmenting they're talking about here is something else I've often recommended with your home networks. Almost all modern routers have the ability to turn on a guest network, and I put all of my IoT devices on my guest network so that they're all segregated from the more juicy stuff like my computers and smartphones and things. There's a very few rare cases where that doesn't work, but in most cases you can do that. Certainly I would think you could probably do that with these smart plugs. But as this article said, if you've got one of these old version two uh, Wemo mini smart plugs, Belkin's never ever going to issue a software update for them. So they're going to remain vulnerable. And if I were you, I would just replace them. Turns out I have two of these in my house right now. Now, I don't have UPnP turned on, uh, and you know, and I do have these devices on my guest network. However, I went ahead and ordered some replacements. I happened to choose a smart plug by a company called Miros, M-E-R-O-S-S. -S. They've got a, a newer version of their mini smart plug uh, that is Matter enabled. Matter is something we talked about recently when we talked about IoT security. It's a new spec that allows these IoT devices to more easily talk to each other for things like configuration. The model I chose was the MSS-115. 
Right now, I think they're only available on the Miros website, uh, though eventually they're supposed to be available on regular places like Amazon. Now, I picked the one that was Matter compatible because that's future-proofing my device. So if you're in the market for any kind of an IoT device, I would definitely favor ones that have Matter support. They're going to be a little more expensive, but I think it's worth it. Okay, moving on. This next one is from Ars Technica. And speaking of routers, this is about a rather nasty piece of malware from Chinese state-sponsored hackers that corrupts routers into being little message passers, little secure message passers for its command and control networks. Researchers on Tuesday unveiled a major discovery, malicious malware that can wrangle a wide range of residential and small office routers into a network that stealthily relays traffic to command and control servers maintained by Chinese state-sponsored hackers. A firmware implant revealed in a write-up from Checkpoint Research contains a full-featured backdoor that allows attackers to establish communications and file transfers with infected devices, remotely issue commands, and upload, download, and delete files. The implant came in the form of firmware images for TP-Link routers. The well-written C++ code, however, took pains to implement its functionality in a firmware agnostic manner, meaning it would be trivial to modify it to run on other router models. The main purpose of the malware appears to be to relay traffic between an infected target and the attacker's command and control servers in a way that obscures the origins and destinations of the communications. With further analysis, Checkpoint Research eventually discovered that the control infrastructure was operated by hackers tied to the Mustang Panda, an advanced persistent threat actor that both Avast and ESET security firms says works on behalf of the Chinese government. And now I've got a series of quotes from Checkpoint Research, and they say, quote, Learning from history, router implants are often installed on arbitrary devices with no particular interest, with the aim to create a chain of nodes between the main infections and the real command and control. In other words, infecting a home router does not mean that the homeowner was specifically targeted, but rather that they are only a means to a goal. The implant can relay communications between two nodes. By doing so, the attackers can create a chain of nodes that will relay traffic to the command and control server. By doing so, the attacker can hide the final command and control as every node in the chain has information only on the previous and next nodes, each node being an infected device. Only a handful of nodes will know the identity of the final command and control. By using multiple layers of nodes to tunnel communication, threat actors can obscure the origin and destination of the traffic, making it difficult for defenders to trace the traffic back to the command and control server. This makes it harder for defenders to detect and respond to the attack. In addition, a chain of infected nodes makes it harder for defenders to disrupt the communication between the attacker and the command and control server. If one node in the chain is compromised or taken down, the attacker can still maintain communication with the C2 or command control server by routing traffic through a different node in the chain, unquote. Using routers and other so-called Internet of Things devices to conceal control servers and covertly proxy traffic is among the oldest tricks in the threat actor tradecraft. Among the best known examples of the other hacking campaigns borrowing this borrowing this page from the playbook is one discovered in 2018 that used VPN filter. The malware was created by the Kremlin-backed APT28, also known as Fancy Bear, and was found infecting more than 500,000 network devices made by Linksys, Microtech, Netgear, TP-Link, and QNAP. Checkpoint researchers still don't know how the malicious implant gets installed on devices. The most likely guesses are that infections are the result of the attackers either exploiting already patched vulnerabilities and I would think they would be unpatched, or taking over devices with weak or default administrative credentials. More technical TP-Link users should check the cryptographic hash of their current firmware to see if it matches any of those provided at the Checkpoint write-up. And again, you'd have to click this article to get that information. Checkpoint didn't provide any simpler ways for users to detect infections. TP-Link representatives didn't respond to messages seeking comment for this post. While the only firmware image discovered so far runs only on TP-Link devices, there's nothing stopping the threat actors from creating images that run on much wider range of devices. Checkpoint recommended the following actions for router users who are concerned they may be infected. One, check connections to the domain m.cremessage.com. That's C-R-E message.com. Two, check the admin panel UE for the modified up upgrade firmware. I'm not sure what that's referring to, actually. Check for the presence of some files, and I'm not going to read these file names off to you. If you're curious, you can check the article. Check the outgoing packets of the router to see if they match the Yara signatures in the post, and be sure to follow proactive mitigations like patching the version of the router and using strong passwords. It's really that last one that, <laughs> that I want to drill home for you guys. 
You should absolutely make sure that your admin password on your router is something good, not whatever the default was that came with the device, and keep your routers up to date. Another thing I will mention here, as long as we're talking about just router basic maintenance and hygiene, is a lot of the hacks against IoT devices, including home routers, are in-memory only, meaning that they're not really stored to any persistent storage on the device, so that if you just reboot it, uh, it's clean. It goes back to whatever the normal software is that has been has not been infected. And also, it's just good to restart your router periodically anyway. Sometimes software can get crufty as it runs for long periods of time. You know, maybe it's got memory it's not cleaning up properly and, and it's kind of running low on memory resources because of that. There are other things too. But it's it's honestly, it's just a good idea to periodically reboot your router every so often. So I would say, you know, once a month, set a note for yourself to reboot your home router. It's just good hygiene, but also make sure you know how to access the admin page of your home router. So you can also look for updates. And if there is an option for auto update, make sure you check that. All right, next up, this is an article from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And this is a topic I've been wanting to discuss for a little while because I think it's important. And there's been a lot of legislation in the United States and also in the UK uh, around these sorts of issues. So I want to read this article first, uh, and then I actually think they're still may be a technical solution to this. So anyway, let me let me start by reading EFF's take on this. Age verification systems are surveillance systems. Mandatory age verification, and with it, mandatory identity verification, is the wrong approach to protecting young people online. It would force websites to require visitors to prove their age by submitting information such as government-issued identification. This scheme would lead us further towards an internet where our private data is collected and sold by default. The tens of millions of Americans who do not have government-issued identification may lose access to much of the internet, and anonymous access to the web would cease to exist. Age verification laws don't just impact young people. It's necessary to confirm the age of all website visitors in order to keep out one select age group. Once information is shared to verify age, there's no way for a website visitor to be certain that the data they're handing over is not going to be retained and used by the website, or further shared and even sold. While some age verification mandates have limits on retention and disclosure of this data, significant risk remains. Users are forced to trust that the website they visit or its third-party verification service, both of which could be fly-by-night companies with no published privacy standards, are following these rules. Further, there is a risk that website employees will misuse the data or that thieves will steal it. The more information a website collects, the more chances there are for it to get into the hands of a marketing company, a bad actor, or someone who has filed a subpoena for it. That would inevitably lead to further data breaches because these laws don't just affect companies that are big enough to have robust data protection. If a website misuses or mishandles the data, the visitor may never find out. And if they do, they might lack an adequate enforcement mechanism. For example, one recent age verification law requires a user to prove, quote, damages resulting from, unquote, the unlawful retention of data in order to hold the website accountable in court, a difficult bar to reach. These mandates wouldn't just kick young people offline. There are tens of millions of U.S. residents without a form of government-issued identification. They could also be kept offline if age verification is required. These are primarily lower income people who are often already marginalized and for whom the internet may be a critical part of life. Last year, France's Audiovisual and Digital Communications Regulatory Authority ordered several sites with adult content to implement age verification. Then France's National Commission on Informatics and Liberty, or CNIL, published a detailed analysis of current age verification methods. It found that no method had the three following important elements. Quote, sufficiently reliable verification, complete coverage of the population, and respect for the protection of the individual's data and privacy and their security, unquote. In short, every age verification method has significant flaws. Whether it's called age assurance or age verification or age estimation, there are only a few ways that technology can work. Verification usually requires a website or its contractor to analyze every user's private information, like the information on government-issued identification cards. The potential alternative is for the website to communicate with third-party companies like credit agencies, but they are known for often having mistaken information. A third option is age estimation via facial analysis, which is used by Instagram. But such face recognition technology has its own privacy and other problems, including clear evidence that errors abound. 
EFF and many other privacy organizations have been concerned about age verification laws for decades. We opposed a previous federal law, COPA, the Child Online Protection Act, which included an age verification requirement. It was struck down as unconstitutional nearly 30 years ago for limiting the First Amendment rights of adults. No one should have to hand over their driver's license just to access free websites. That's why EFF opposes mandated age verification laws, no matter how well-intentioned they may be. Dozens of bills currently being debated by state and federal lawmakers could result in dangerous age verification mandates. We will resist them. So again, this is another one of those cases where, you know, the the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I understand why they're doing this. I understand the need, the desire at least, to keep certain content away from people who are too young to view it. But as soon as we start requiring these websites to verify the age of their users, even if they're free users, even if they don't normally have to have an account, this is going to set up a privacy nightmare. And this means we all have to do it, not just the kids, everybody, because they don't know until you've proven who you are, or at least what your age is, who you are and whether or not you're allowed to access the site. And the UK tried something like this, and I hope I don't get this wrong, but what I remember reading about this in the UK is they were trying to block access to porn sites. And so you had to prove your age. And, and in some cases, you had to get like a proof of age by going to an authority that could verify your age. And well, the post office was one place, apparently. That sort of makes sense. But another place you could go was to a bar or a pub because they're used to checking people's ages as well. But, but either case, can you imagine going to either of these places saying, you know, hey, I want to go to Pornhub.com, you know, so I need I need a, a hall pass. So here's my ID. <laughs> Let me in. Obviously, it all comes down to how they do this. I did have an idea on this, and, and I heard someone else on another podcast actually saying something similar that might work, that might be able to do this. And if there was a way, for example, for us to verify a simple age question, like not what is your age, but are you older than 18? Let's, you know, let's ask for the least amount of information possible. I don't want to know your name. I don't want to know anything else about you. I just want to know if you, the person asking me right now is over the age of 18. Yes or no. I think it's possible that we could maybe come up with some sort of a system where like, let's say the website pops up a QR code with a challenge. And we're going to actually talk about a similar thing here in a minute with passkeys. But where a website pops up this challenge, it's some sort of cryptographic challenge and maybe like in a QR code. And you with your phone scan that QR code and then you get a special one-time number of some sort, like a kind of like a pin code. And what happened under the covers was that QR code had a single question and it should show you on your phone what that question is. And you should say yes or no. I want to, I want my phone to answer this question. And that question should be binary. Yes or no. Are you over 18 years of age and your phone, if it had some sort of a method to just answer that question, if it has to go to the cloud, it doesn't say where that question came from. So it's not like it's, I'm saying, Hey, Pornhub wants to know if, if Carrie's over the age of 18, all it's going to be is, Hey, the owner of this device has a question, is this person over the age of 18? And if there is a third party that can verify that the answer to that question, yes or no, it should be able to send back a response to that challenge, which has the answer to the question, which cannot be forged, and then has some sort of credentials saying, this is who's vouching for this, and then respond to that question on the website. And this would, this would all happen automatically. Your phone would just do this automatically behind the scenes and would answer that question on a one-time basis. It wouldn't store, it wouldn't store the result in any way that that query and response would be new every time you went back to that site. So yes, it'd be a pain in the butt, but at least at that point it would require no uploading of your government ID or facial recognition to try to guess your age. And hopefully that would still, you know, retain your privacy. Now it's still got lots of issues, right? Cause not everybody has smartphones. So there's still, you know, First Amendment issues here where people not being able to access freely available material on the internet because they don't have the, you know, the technology to do so. That That's a problem. But I think at least if this is going to be mandated by governments that we probably could come up with some privacy preserving options to handle some of this age verification. All right, one more article here and then we'll get to the tip of the week and the Dear Carrie question of the week. And this is from 9to5Mac and this is really cool. Uh, this is a new feature that's coming for uh, Apple devices. I think in particular uh, iPads and iPhones. I don't think it's going to be available on the Mac, but it 
would be kind of nice if it was. Anyway, it's called Personal Voice. And it basically lets you bank your voice print. So let me explain what that means by reading the article. While personal voice was one of the most exciting of the upcoming accessibility features Apple announced this week, you may have thought it wasn't relevant to most people, but a new report today suggests that we should all take advantage of it when iOS 17 launches. That's because loss of speech ability can occur very suddenly through medical conditions like ALS. By the time that people realize they need a synthesized voice that sounds like them, it may be too late. We're all familiar with the speech synthesizer used by the late Stephen Hawking. He would select words and phrases that would be spoken aloud, but in a very robotic voice. The next major development was much more natural sounding speech like that used by Siri. But the best option of all, for those who can no longer speak clearly or at all, is a voice that sounds just like you. This is possible using technology known as voice banking. Your voice is recorded while you speak a bunch of phrases and a computer system creates a voice that sounds just like yours by learning your timbre, accent, intonation, and timing of your speech. Conventional voice banking is a laborious process. It typically requires you to speak aloud 1,500 phrases and can be expensive as well as time-consuming. Philip Green, a director of an ALS-focused nonprofit, told FastCo that voice banking took him several weeks. And the article goes on to explain what he had to do, but it was, it was painful. What Apple has achieved with personal voice is using a powerful AI system to carry out the voice banking process in just 15 minutes. And this is a quote from Apple, I think, in advertising this feature. Users can create a personal voice by reading along with a randomized set of text prompts to record 15 minutes of audio on iPhone or iPad. This speech accessibility feature uses on-device machine learning to keep users' information private and secure and integrates seamlessly with live speech so users can speak their personal voice when connecting with loved ones. And back to the article. One concern about conventional voice banking is that it's carried out on a server. Were that server to be hacked, it creates the risk of someone getting a hold of your voice file and being able to make phone calls that sound just like you. Apple accessibility lead Sarah Herlinger says that the company was very mindful of this kind of risk, which is why all the processing happens locally on your device using the neural engine. And this is a quote from Herlinger, quote, along with accessibility being one of our core corporate values, so is privacy. And we don't believe that one should have to give up one to get the other, unquote. Personal voice not only reduces the time and effort involved for those already di diagnosed with a condition known to lead to loss of speech, but it's sufficiently painless that it makes sense for everyone to do it as an insurance policy. Salesforce exec Brooke Eby agrees, and this is a quote from Brooke. After being diagnosed with ALS, Eby took to Instagram and TikTok to share her journey, educate others about ALS, and generally get the world more comfortable talking about the disease and its implication for those who have it. Talking to others in the community, quote, I constantly hear, I wish I had voice banked sooner. Some people all of a sudden will just start slurring their words and then it's almost too late to voice bank. They're like, never mind, this doesn't sound like me anyway, so I might as well just use a generic robot voice, unquote. So I agree with this author. I think this is something we should all do when this is available. If you've got an iPhone or an iPad, uh, iOS 16 will probably come out in September when the new iPhones usually come out. It will be announced almost certainly at the keynote for the Worldwide Developer Conference, which is on June 5th or at least sometime during that week. But again, it probably won't be available until iOS 17 is actually released, which won't be till this fall. But when it comes out, I certainly plan to use it. I kind of wish, I mean, obviously, as, as, as a podcaster, I've got a lot of recorded sound of my voice. In this case, it sounds like I'll have to use the iPhone and, and talk into it there, which that's okay, too. But I'd love to be able to do this on my Mac somehow, because I've got a, <laughs> I've got a really nice microphone on my Mac that would sound much, much better. But anyway, it's a cool feature, and I certainly plan to use it when it comes out. All right, now it's time for our Dear Carrie question, which will also lead to my tip of the week. And Kathy asked me, what is your opinion of Google Pass Keys in addition to the YubiKeys I have already set up? And the email actually goes on to, to say more about the specific setup. But I have said recently that I wanted to talk uh, a bit more at length about Pass Keys. And so I wrote an article uh, for my blog, which you can go read, of course. And there is a link in the show notes uh, about the pros and cons of Pass Keys. Today, I'm going to more focus on the problems, but I will briefly talk about the pros. So first of all, to Kathy's question, passkeys are kind of like, I don't know, maybe a software version of, of YubiKeys. She talks about using YubiKeys here. YubiKeys are hardware keys. They're little devices that usually look like a thumb drive. Sometimes they're the really small versions are very, very tiny and meant to be like almost no bigger than the plug that they go into on purpose, like they're meant to be very low profile. 
uh, and they've got little crypto cryptographic chips in them, very secure storage where you can store passwords and pass keys and things like that. And this is usually considered the gold standard because you have to have these physical keys in order to get at any of those passwords. They never leave the device. And a lot of people with high profile threats, you know, rich people, politicians, whatever, pe famous people, people that might be targets for cyber criminals and trying to get into their accounts. This is often the way they go. But there's some downside to these hardware keys as well. A lot of times these keys don't have any biometrics on them. So actually, if you did steal the key, you can just use it. But that does mean you've got to actually be there. You know, this is not an attack you can do from across the globe over the internet. But even Yubico, the maker of YubiKeys, kind of basically figured out that a lot of people just don't want to do that. They don't want to have to carry this key, or in some cases, multiple keys, around on their person all the time just to be able to get into their accounts. But it turns out there is something that all of us carry with us all the time these days, and that is your smartphone. So the compromise with pass keys basically allows your smartphone to act as a hardware key. And because we have that with us all the time anyway, and also because that's often where we're logging in from, like the phone itself, it makes sense to combine all that functionality into your smartphone device. So Kathy, to answer your question, I think for most people, honestly, using pass keys is a, is a really good compromise. Pass keys are in a lot of ways more secure than standard passwords. You could argue that they're not quite as secure as a physical hardware key. Though, honestly, the way most of this stuff is done now, really, I think it really just turns your phone into a hardware key. So I, I, I think it's pretty much the same and much more convenient. Now, these are really complicated specifications, and, and I'm glossing over some of these details. So this is this we're looking at this at a high level. But now let me back up a little bit and tell you a little bit about how passkeys work and how they differ from passwords. Then we'll talk about how they are slowly rolling out. And then I'm, finally, I want to tell you the main point of this whole thing is why you might want to wait a little bit before you jump on this bandwagon. All right, so really quickly, passwords and usernames are what we've used for decades to authenticate ourselves to accounts, to our computer accounts, to online web accounts. Uh, we give them a username, which identifies who we are, and then we give them the password associated with that username, which says, yes, we really are that person because only that person has this password. So therefore, I must be the person I say I am. Now, that is a shared secret scenario. So we both have the password. Actually, we both have the hash for the password. But I, when I set up the account, we said, here's our agreed upon shared secret. And whenever I come back, as long as I am able to produce that shared secret and you can check it against the one you saved off when I created the account, then you're going to assume that you're talking to me. Now, there's a lot of problems with passwords. One of them being if you choose a crappy one, someone else can guess it and still get into your account. Also, the websites that you log into, let's say Yahoo, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, whatever, they've got all these account passwords now that they've got to save somewhere. Now, they're not saving the actual passwords themselves. They're saving a cryptographically hashed version of your password, which is theoretically very difficult to reverse. Like given the hash, it, it should be near impossible to figure out what the password is unless you've picked a really crappy password then they, and then all I have to do is pre-calculate that hash. And if the hash is matched, they know which crappy password that is. So now all these websites that are maintaining these accounts have to hold on to these shared secrets and they could be stolen, they could be abused by a rogue employee, et cetera, et cetera. Not good. So pass keys use a public private key pair. So it's asymmetric. And when you set up the account, instead of having a shared secret, one that you both must maintain, you create a pair of keys, a private key and a public key. Uh, the public key is the one that the website saves, and that public key can be seen by anybody. It's useless to an attacker. It's useless to somebody that steals it. The public key is not what matters. But because that public key is cryptographically tied to the private key, what that allows the website to do is to validate you using the public key against the private key. So in practice, what happens is when you go to log in, under the covers, because this is this is something you don't really see, but under the covers, what's happening is the website says, okay, this person claims to be Carrie. I've got Carrie's public key that we set up when we created the account, and I'm going to create a challenge and send that challenge to the person making the request. And if that person really does have the matching private key, they will be able to send a proper valid response to that challenge. Basically, they will ask me a question that only I can answer. Though in reality, they're going to ask my device a question, which only my device can answer. And I'll come back to why that's important in a minute. So you actually don't see this. That's one of the benefits of pass keys is there's no entering of anything. You don't type anything in. You don't even have to copy and paste from your password manager. It just all happens under the covers. And you say, I want to log in and I want to use my pass key to do it. And it says, boom, you're in. 
And behind the scenes, it's done all this challenge and response stuff. So the good part is, is now you no longer even have to generate passwords and have a, a and type them in anywhere or even autofill them with your password manager. It's This is all done behind the scenes under the covers. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. And you're guaranteed to have a long, strong, unique password for every site. That, that's this private key, basically. And the websites you're visiting don't have to hold on to any secrets. It doesn't matter if they encrypt these things or not. It doesn't matter if uh, these public keys don't help anybody. But they do allow that website to challenge you to prove who you are because only the person with the matching private key could properly respond to that challenge. Now, things get a little weird when you start talking about the implementation. Ideally, the way this works is like a YubiKey, like a hardware key, where your private keys, and you're going to have one for every website you have an account for, are stored in a very secure hardware chip on your phone. So now you've got a situation where one of two things has to occur. If you only ever have one location for all your private keys, and those private keys are always on, let's say, your smartphone. That means that when you're logging in from a tablet or you're logging in from a computer, then you have to somehow transitively prove that you are who you say you are with your device. The way that can work is you go to the website and you say, I want to use pass keys, uh, and I don't. I, I can't do it on this device. I need to do it on a different device. So then what you, when you click that kind of login option, it should pop up something like a QR code. And now with your authenticating device, the device that actually has the pass keys in it, you scan it, you scan that QR code. And then it does some magic behind the scenes using a little bit of Bluetooth and a little bit of other stuff to respond to that challenge and, and prove that you are proximate, that you are near the device uh, that you're actually trying to authenticate from. Again, really complicated, I'm not going to get into the details, but it requires some Bluetooth usually. And then again, you're logged in. But you had to, instead of just clicking the button and getting in like you would on your phone, you now had to actually have a second device. So, you know, you went from your laptop to, to scan a code with your, with your phone. It's, it's not much harder, but it did require a little extra effort. And one thing I've glossed over so far is what happens when you try to log in uh, on your phone, when it detects that you're trying to respond to this challenge, you have to, again, prove to the phone that you are the person holding it. So that's where it becomes important that it's through your phone. And that's kind of a proxy thing where, first of all, you have to prove to your phone that you are you, and then your phone will respond to this challenge. So that can be done with biometrics with a you know face ID or a fingerprint ID, or you could use a pin code. And that's usually done per challenge. So now if you're thinking, well, why do I have to always have this one device? Like I've got a password manager and my password manager syncs all my passwords across all my devices. So I can enter my password from any one of my devices. And if I change a password on one device, it automatically changes it on all my other devices. They're synchronized through the cloud securely. But you're telling me with pass keys, I always have to have the one device? Well, not really. People realize this is a problem. So they want to provide ways to synchronize your private keys across your devices. But this is where we run into some problems. The way that Apple and Google and Microsoft are initially going to want to do this is they're going to want to control that whole process. They're going to say, only we can do this right. Only we can do this securely. You've got to trust us and no one else. And we will give you a method to synchronize your private keys across your devices. This is something that the hardware keys kind of don't allow you to do. You know, once you've got this hardware key, it's not as easy to export and import these private keys. It's not supposed to be from a security standpoint. You really don't want to be able to do that. But, and this is outside the spec for this new WebAuthn FIDO2 passkey thing. This is kind of beyond that. And my guess is at some point they might define this and make it a, a, a part of the spec or some related spec. But you really don't want to be able to easily get these private keys out of your device. I mean, by definition, right? They're, they're supposed to be held in a very, very secure vault. So saying that I can just copy those out to somewhere else is kind of disturbing to some security people. But for convenience, you almost have to have some way to do this. So Apple and Microsoft and Google uh, are building in ways through iCloud and whatever Google's cloud is, some way within the operating system on devices that they make will allow you to, in some proprietary fashion, hopefully a very secure way, synchronize your, your private keys across your devices. So you don't necessarily always have to have that one magic device with you whenever you want to log in from any other device. Now, the problem with that is it really kind of locks you into those devices now. Like, for example, what if, I, what, what if I'm a person who's got an iPhone, but I've got a Windows PC? How is that going to work? It's probably not at least not until they come up with some standard spec that allows cross-platform synchronizing. And no one is going to be in a rush to do that. Apple is claiming 
I saw this, I think it was on a Mastodon thread, so I'm not sure how how much we can rely on this, but I think it was an Apple developer, someone from Apple was saying, we're working on it, it's going to happen, it's not there yet, but we will eventually allow multi-platform synchronization. I'll believe that when I see it, because until then, it gives like vendor lock-in. It makes you need to stay within their ecosystem in order to use that feature. Now, another way this could be done, and it's not quite as convenient, it could be a little bit error prone, is you could potentially have multiple private keys associated with a single account. So if I go to amazon.com for my phone, I'm using a private public key pair that I used for my phone to authenticate, but then I could also go to my computer, let's say, and set up a different public private key pair with amazon.com and Amazon would just keep two public keys for me. And it would know actually then which device I'm logging in from as well. And I could potentially invalidate one device without invalidating the other devices by deleting the public key associated with you know, a device, maybe I'm going to sell my computer. So I want to make sure that computer is no longer able to log into my Amazon account. That also means you're going to have to create multiple pass keys for all of your main accounts on all your devices. Now, of course, the other problem with pass keys right now is that very few websites even support it. There is a website that is tracking this right now, kind of like there have been similar ones for two-factor authentication, and it's called passkeys.directory. If you go to that website, it's a searchable list of, uh, of websites and services that, that are currently supporting passkeys. It is growing by the day. A lot of people are starting to add support for this. So keep an eye on that. But the other thing we, you might want to wait for uh, is you might want to wait for your, your preferred password manager to start supporting passkeys as well. One password is supporting passkeys uh, in June, I think. LastPass has said they're going to be supporting them soon, as is Bitwarden. Dashlands is doing it too. They're all working on this. And that should be a way for you to be platform independent. Once they have this set up, and they certainly will probably have the option for you to synchronize your, your pass keys, your private keys amongst your devices. That's really the solution that I personally am waiting on, because that should allow them to be completely platform independent. All right, so I am sure I will have more to say on passkeys as this stuff rolls out. My basic advice to you right now is probably you want to hold off until there is some third-party solution, like, like probably your password manager that has a way for you to synchronize your private keys across all your devices. But however, if you want to say I'm, I'm an Apple person through and through, or I'm a Google person through and through, I'm just only ever going to want to log in from one major vendors systems, you know, you could go ahead and adopt it. Or if you want to say, you know what, I'm going to be that person that says my smartphone is it. That's where the pass keys live. I'm not, I don't want to synchronize through the cloud. I don't care how secure they think it's going to be. I want to treat this like a YubiKey scenario or a hardware key scenario where my smartphone is the device that has the single copy of all of my private keys. If that's the way you're going to go, you could do that now too. And none of this, other, none of this other stuff about cross-platform stuff will matter. And then you'll just have to uh, be able to do these cross-device things, which means you'll have to have Bluetooth on probably. And then when challenged on one device, you'll need to have your smartphone nearby so that you could respond to that challenge, probably by scanning a QR code. Now, one more thing that's going to make the implementation about this troublesome is that my guess is for years to come, most websites are going to continue to support passwords alongside pass keys. So if they're going to still have passwords as your backup or your recovery mechanism, uh, I'm, it, it kind of takes away a lot of the advantages of the pass keys. All right. Again, I'm sure there will be much more to come on this, but I wanted to kind of stop and give everybody a pause on this and let you know that pass keys, while ha they have a lot of promise and they, they, they should be much more convenient, they should be phishing proof. There should be, because there's no way for a bad guy to trick you into giving up your private key. There's no more shared secrets. The, the websites where you have accounts, it doesn't matter if they get hacked. Your public keys won't do the bad guys any good. There's certainly nothing for you to memorize anymore or even have to click a button to generate. You don't have to type these things in ever. Pass keys have a lot of advantages. Uh, I'm looking forward to when <laughs> this is finally implemented and all this details are, are ironed out. But until then... I would kind of hold off on this and I'll just keep you posted and let you and let you know when I think it's a good time to jump in. All right. So there you have it. There's your news, your dear Carrie question and your tip of the week. All right, everybody, that'll do it for this week. Send me your dear Carrie questions. I'm actually kind of getting low. I've got a few more left in the hopper, but I, I could use some more. So send those, uh, you could just email me at dearcarry at firewallsdontstopdragons.com. 
Uh, or if you want, you can send me even a voice clip. I haven't had anybody take me up on that offer yet, but if you want to actually record yourself asking the question, I will play it on the air. Uh, you can find all the details about that if you go to fdsd.me slash Q&A. I just recorded two more interviews. I've got four interviews in the hopper at this point. I'm, I'm booked solid. But in addition to the ones I've already mentioned this week, I talked to Josh Corman again. Great guy. Uh, always very interesting discussion. And we talked about the White House policy directive on cybersecurity, uh, all five pillars and what that means and lots of background information on that. I also just talked to a panel of folks uh, representing the Electronic Frontier Alliance. I want to kind of talk about how you can get involved with projects, uh, maybe even start your own if you're really passionate about something. That was a fun talk. So those are all coming up soon. But next week, we'll be talking with Andrea Mico, uh, who has several updates about the state of privacy in cars. Spoiler alert, it's not good. But Privacy for Cars, his organization, uh, is doing some great work in this area. And in fact, they just released a really cool new tool uh, that will help us with this. So we'll be talking all about that next week. Coming up in June, I will be kicking off some sort of a promotion for the Dragon Challenge Coin 2.0. They're really cool. I minted 100 of those in various metal finishes, including some very rare black ones. And next month, I'll be telling you how you can get yourself one of these super cool coins. You can learn more about those by going to fdsd.me slash coin2, the number two. You can also go to my website, d20key.com, d20 like a d20 die that would roll in Dungeons & Dragons, d20key.com, and click on the tabs at the top to learn more about what we call diceware and using this coin or d20 dice to generate passphrases. But it also has pictures of the coin. That The one that are on the website are still the old coins. It's the same front, but the back is different for the 2.0. So if you want to see the, the front and the especially the back, the new back, look for the dragon coins on my website, including that you know, fdsd.me slash coin2 will take you to the old promotion, which has pictures of the coin. All right, that'll do it this week, everybody. Take care. Stay safe out there. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. Thank you.